Oh, I, uh, she always beats me. <laughs> hey there, everybody. Welcome to the sports on the Positive Tip podcast. We have a special returning, recurring guest. He's like a ringer for us this morning. <laughs> um, this is Kenny and Kenny Squared. And Mike Clark. Good morning. Mike Clark is in the building. Mike, welcome. So glad to get you on this week and uh, so we can just chat around and we've got some perspective from here in the Northeast, got some perspective down South, we got some perspective in the Midwest. So uh, how you guys doing? All right. Yeah, good. Like we were talking, it's a a weird time to be a sports fan these last couple of days, sort of slow these last couple of days with no, no baseball going on. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, Kenny, well, how did you fill your time last night? Uh, we, we were saying how we were surfing Netflix and Amazon. <laughs> what did you do last night without any games? Uh, I went to bed early. Went to bed early. <laughs> well, that's always a good thing with your two little ones. Uh, well, uh, why don't we start here? The All-Star game was Tuesday night. And I I, I text Kenny, Mike, uh, that meh for me I I don't know man these all-star games are almost the same they're still by far the best all-star games the baseball one but it's it's still man you you have the pitcher going just one inning so they just empty the tank and the hitters can't touch these pitchers you know we have another low scoring game it didn't feel like it was close even though it's three to two for a long time it seems like the whole game was three to two and I just never got the feeling the National League was gonna was going to catch them. So, I mean, it's so much fun seeing, uh, you know, uh, uh, the home team players, although guys from my team didn't do anything. Um, you know, obviously uh, Stanton, you know, uh, got the MVP. So anxious to hear you two guys take on the all-star game that the American League again won. What is that, nine or ten in a row for them? I think nine in a row. They just dominate, but they have a bomb squad, you know. Um, and, and, and some interesting things. I'm anxious to hear you guys take on all the microphones, Big Poppy running around in the dugouts, you know. Um, so, Mike, let's start with you. What was your take on the All-Star game? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it was the same you said. that The game itself, it's, man, with the arms they have these days, it it's tough for anyone to do anything. You could see it. I mean, every guy was coming in throwing, you know, 101 sinkers. It's like, how are you supposed to do anything with it? Uh, so the actual competitive game part itself is still just sort of, uh, yeah, it's tough. It's tough. I don't know how what hitters are supposed to do. Um, I think uh, the the biggest takeaways I had from the weekend was the the microphone. Man, when Trevino and Cortez were mic'd up and were calling that inning on their on the fly, just hearing that to me as a fan, like that was just awesome. Hearing how they talk and. Uh, uh, yeah. When um, the guy from uh, the Blue Jays, Alec Manoa, when he was mic'd up, uh, he, he, he's going to win a lot of fans. He's a fun, funny dude. Yeah. You know, he, he hit yeah. a batter, and he was like, you know, that's me. I might strike you out. I might hit you. He's like, I'm not sure. Uh, and just the, the microphone perspective, I, man, we need more of that in baseball just so they can yeah. see these players' personalities. Uh, the ump cam I thought was pretty cool, yeah. uh, seeing that perspective. I don't know how in the world those – I don't know how they ever touch a baseball. Like, I don't know how they, like, not even, they they showed, I remember they showed one where Kershaw threw his slider inside to a right-hand hitter. And to us, it's like, oh, man, he should have got a piece of that. But then you see it from the ump cam. You don't even see the ball. It's just flying down at your feet as soon as it leaves. Like, it's like, man, how in the world do they do any of that? Yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah. I think the microphones were awesome in the different camera views. Uh, Big Poppy, I thought, uh, I thought it was hilarious. I loved it. I loved what he was doing. And also, why is he not playing still? He looked like he was in better shape than some of the players were. Big <laughs> Poppy. They need to get him a bat and get him back out there. Uh, but, yeah, no, I, 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 I enjoyed it. I think the biggest story coming out of the All-Star break, I read last night about uh, – I don't know if y'all saw the story about Juan Soto uh, having to fly commercial. Man, that's just crazy. <laughs> that blew my mind. That, uh, that's crazy. I get he turns down a contract, but to make my man fly commercial across the country and not get in until two in the morning, that's that's saying a lot about your organization. So I think that's going to be the biggest story that comes out of the weekend. Yeah, uh, I, I, I want to stay on that for a second. I'll come back to it. Um, I love all those perspectives. Kenny, let me hear yours. 
Yeah. Um, it was, it was a lot of fun. I really liked, um, I really liked the Trevino Cortez conversation too. I thought that was really cool. Cause like you usually don't see like that type of uh, perspective to me. What was also so interesting though, is like the battery made of those two, like no one saw that as an all-star duo right there. Um, and to me, that was like, it was really fun to kind of see, especially like Trevino mic'd up like the next inning, kind of talking to guys like, Hey, like I'm still so shocked that I'm an all-star yeah. and like yeah. congratulating all the guys as he was coming up. Like, I thought that was really cool. Um, and yeah, like, I feel like we should get more mic'd up moments in baseball in general. Like it's fun go- getting it for the all-star game. Also, um, ESPN does a pretty good job. Like typically Alex Verdugo's in there for a couple innings. Maybe they'll get a couple other guys. I, I mean, Yankees Red Sox is basically Sunday night baseball. Right. So, oh, every um, time they play. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but like, I, I kind of wish they would do that a little bit more because I feel like having that, like, like you kind of get that deeper perspective because like the NFL, they'll do that every once in a while, like with the NFL films, you kind of get some pieces here and there. Um, but like having like a guy mic'd up for a couple innings, having the, the broadcasters kind of just hit them up in conversation, asking them about random stuff. Like um, when they ask judge and Stanton, like, what do you guys do when you're out here? Just kind of sitting there like, yeah, sometimes we play charades. Sometimes we just have fun. Um, I just think it's really cool to have that. Um, I kind of agree the game itself, aside from like the first setting for the national league and what, what was it? The third inning when with the back-to-back home runs, yeah, not a ton of action. Um, no action except pitching, yeah, <laughs> except for pitching. I, I think it was something like 20 in a row at one point were retired by the national league or re- retired by the American league for the national league hitters. It, it is just, it's become a very pitcher dominant event. I was low key hoping for a tie just to kind of see how the home run derby would be. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it is what it is. Um, it's cool that Stanton got the MVP. Um, I think also his story of like, yeah, I probably just hit a baseball into a place that I used to sit as a kid. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, I, I'll give you my perspective real quick. I will come back to, to Soto and, and uh, what, what we've been saying, I think starts to bear truth a little bit, but real quick, the uh, Trevino and a few of the guys that were mic'd up, but particularly Trevino, uh, you love when you see the players care that much because he stepped out and he said, man, I I can't believe I'm at the all-star game, you know? I mean, uh, who knew he he would even be the Yankees starting catcher this year, uh, you know, let alone that he'd be, you know, playing in an all-star game. So I I thought that that was pretty cool. And, And I don't know, maybe this was me. A lot of those guys in the American League are really crazy young, right? And it was a few veterans, obviously, but they had a lot of first timers, a lot of young guys. It seemed like half those guys didn't know who Big Poppy was. They were like, "Who's this nut running through the dugout?" <laughs> it's not that long that he played, right? I mean, he's been retired six, seven years, maybe. But it seems like they were like looking at him, like, "Who's this guy?" And it looked like Judge and and uh, Stanton didn't even want to talk to him. It's like still the old rivalry, you know, with the Yankees and Red Sox. They're like, "Yeah, right." But then he did say, "Pay the man, pay the man," you know, with Judge, which was, which was pretty cool. He probably got a little in trouble for that, I would think, when he got back. The Fox people, uh, listen, uh, yeah, David, you shouldn't be saying that, you know. Uh, he gets fined for tampering. Yeah, yeah, you, you're supposed to be an objective observer here. Um, but 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 overall, man, I just I would like to see a more competitive game with a little offense. I mean, watching the pitching is is great. Um, the mic'd up, yeah, you know, some of it. I'm like some of, some of the guys they chose had zero personality, but uh, a couple of the guys they chose, like the guy from Toronto, uh, I I loved every second of that. Um, and and the Cortez, they need to do that more often. The Cortez, and they won't do it in the regular season because. You know, the games really count, I don't think. But they can mic up guys a little bit more in the regular season, uh, like a third baseman and something like that. I thought that was really fun. <laughs> Let's go back to Soto for a second because, um, Kenny, you're the numbers guy. I, I, I read somewhere that his average salary per year wouldn't even make him the highest paid player, which is probably the reason that he turned it down. But, you know, when we look at that, right away us us poor working slobs right we're like how do you turn down 440 million dollars you know 
but there's got to be some underlying reasons. And the Nationals, they just lose guys. I mean, it's almost like they've taken up the tradition of the Expos because they used to be the Expos, you know, used to use guys, lose guys like Andre Dawson, Galarraga, Pedro Martinez. We go on and on with the guys the Expos used to just trade away or, or wouldn't sign, you know, Tim Raines. And now the Nationals have kind of taken that tradition, but there's something got to be underlying in that organization, right? I mean, when this comes out, and, and, and I thought at first, that can't be true, right? They didn't, he didn't fly commercial. Maybe he just wanted to get out of there quick. But then the Nationals haven't said anything. They haven't said, oh, no, <laughs> you know, we we flew them. You know, we every every other team, they, they fly a private jet, right? Uh, and so, and even like Mets and Yankees, there's been times where they've flown on the same, you know, same airplane, same jet. So I, maybe there's something underlying in that organization. But what do you guys, what's you guys take on that? And Kenny, what does the numbers come to real quick? Um, so he would be making 29 million a year, which all time would be uh, the 20th as in terms of average annual value. Wow. Guys that make more than him that are playing right now. Uh, let's see. Mookie Betts is making more. David Price this year. Miguel Cabrera. Corey right. Seager. Oh <laughs> Nolan Arenado. Uh, Trevor Bauer. Ba- well, Trevor Bauer would have been. Wow. Uh, Francisco Lindor. Anthony Rendon. Steven Strasburg. Carlos Correa. Mike Trout. Garrett Cole. And Max Scherzer. So, yeah, a lot of those guys aren't better than him. That's for sure. <laughs> you know, um, does that add, Mike, a different perspective for you? And and what are your what's your whole take on this? Yeah, no, I mean, I get, I get why he would turn it down. He's I mean, he's 23 and they want to lock him up for 15 years. I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's a long time uh, to stay in an organization that hasn't really proven they can keep a solid team. Uh, that, that's a long time to commit. And, I mean, he has Scott Boris as an agent. So, you know, he's getting he's getting top dollar regardless of where he goes. Uh, I, I think he's as good as gone. I mean, I, honestly, I sort of have a feeling it might be by next week's trade deadline. I think uh, I think the Nash, I think that whole thing, because like you said, I thought it was a, just a rumor also. But his agent came out last night. It was like he did, in fact, have to fly charter or fly uh, across the country, you know, like commercial. It was, it was mind-blowing, especially because the Braves, they left from Washington to go to L.A. Uh, they had a plane for their All-Stars and their families. Uh, they left after the game. They got there six hours before he did. Uh, and, and then you have this guy who, who is supposed to be your team cornerstone, and he's, like, at the airport and the American Airlines, like, check out my – like, I think it's sour to the point that I think they're going to make a move quick. Uh, it worries me because the teams that are in play for them, uh, it could get real bad real fast. Um, what It looks like the Dodgers, uh, Dodgers are going to be in pretty heavy. Yeah, yeah, the Dodgers have the farm system to do it too, which is scary. Uh, but I think um, – I, I, I told you this last year. I think he's destined to end up in pinstripe somehow. I think it's going to happen. I don't know how the Yankees do it or pull it off. Uh, I think he ends up in pinstripes. I think that's where he wants to go. I think he wants to play in New York. So either way, though, I think, long story short, I don't think he finishes the season as a national. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Kenny? Yeah, um, I had this up. I had sent this to you. Uh, Nationals players that were offered contracts since 2019. Bryce Harper was offered $300 million and turned it down. Anthony Rendon, 210 to 215 million, turned it down. Trey Turner, 100 million, turned it down. Um, and obviously, all those guys are gone. Um, I don't really understand why, because the Nationals three years ago did win the World Series, but it seems yeah. like they really don't like to keep their, their star players not named Ryan Zimmerman, which, like, I, I understand, like, okay, he's like the first guy, but like, if you had, Anthony Rendon still on your team, Bryce Harper, um, Trey Turner. Obviously, Max Scherzer probably would have left anyway through free agency. Like, you have all those guys plus Juan Soto. You've got a really good team. You got a team that could compete with the Mets and the Braves. But it kind of just seems like they're like, I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't understand it. I kind of 
at first I thought, okay, so it seems like he's probably going to be gone. Maybe you trade him in the off season because he still has a couple years of control, but now it just kind of seems like they're ready to just move on. And it'll be, it'll be interesting because I've, I read somewhere that they're saying like kind of a Kevin Durant type of return. I don't know if they'll get that, especially if they're really trying to trade him at the trade deadline, but also he has two and a half years of control left. So, but any team that would get him, whether that would be the Yankees, whether that's the Mets, the Dodgers, whoever, um, any team that would get him, you'd kind of have to sign him. Um, Cause like, you're not giving up your top three prospects plus a couple of regular position players and then risk losing lost, him in a couple uh, of years. Sound for a second, guys. I'm um, sorry. Let me just uh, hit pause. Uh, I, I, I told Kenny this. I think that if he gets traded to trade deadline, and I think that's a really good call out that that's the difference in maybe a team going to the World Series. Because he could get hot and carry a team. Let's just say uh, I'll I'll give another team maybe out west that would probably sign him long term. And I, I think you guys made a good point that you don't really have to sign him long term, right? Because uh, he's got two and a half more years of control. But let's just say the Padres a team like that, mm. and and they and they bring back and Tatis comes back from injury. Think about a guy like Soto on that team, and he gets hot. You know, would he carry them not only into the postseason, but possibly to the World Series? Uh, the Mets as well. I don't think the Mets will do it in the in the midseason. You know, um, and Mike got nervous there for a second. The Yankees, on the other hand, would probably do that in, in midseason. I mean, what do you what do you think about that, Kenny? I think there's a chance. Um, it'll be interesting to see what type of package they put together because they've been very like. Um, they've been very firm gripped on their top prospects, especially um, Volpe, who had a, who's in the futures game, did a great job there. Um, Jason Dominguez too; they've been very high on. Um, you would have to probably give up one or both of those guys. Yeah, um, I would assume Joey Gallo would probably go just because they can. But like, um, I mean, they gave up six prospects for Joey Gallo. Yeah. So I don't think they'd be very worried wow. about giving up prospects. Um, I do wonder what that would look like, though, as far yeah. as what a deal would be. MLB.com has uh, – you, you almost hit it right on the head. They, they have a proposed trade of Torres, Nestor Cortez, Volpe, and Jason Dominguez for Soto. Ooh. Yeah, that's a heavy package. That's a lot. That's crazy. Wow. Uh, uh, but the Yankees would do that, though. I can yeah. see, I, I can see Cash replying because he, he's a generational player, man. He's you know, uh, and and if if you lock him up for ten years, let's say I don't know about the fifteen, he's he's a generational player. But the Nats need to get their act together, man. They you know because they're gonna have they're obviously gonna get a lot of good prospects for them. They're gonna come up and do the same thing, you know. So I, there's something in that organization that we can't put our fingers on. Um, let's shift gears over to last week's Mets Braves and, and the upcoming Mets Braves. And so, Kenny, I'm going to ask you to chime in as well. But obviously, Mike and I probably watched every pitch, every inning of that three game series. And uh, Kenny, I think I might have mentioned this last week. Mike and I had a, I'm not a wagering guy, but he said uh, that the, the, the Braves were going to sweep. I said, I'll buy you family dinner if they do. I didn't buy his family dinner, unfortunately, for him. Uh, because the Mets did take two out of three. And, and that was big for the Mets because uh, the Braves have just been unbelievably blistering hot. And so, Mike, let's give you some space. What was your take on the series and what are you looking forward to here? Yeah, uh, honestly, I don't feel bad. I feel um, the Braves, their starting pitcher is about as bad as it's been all year in those three games. I don't know because we had our, we had our, you know, so our top top of the rotation guys lined up uh, and none of them made it out of the fifth inning, which is, that's been a long, the reason the Braves have been so good and since June 1st is they're starting pitching. We've been running the same five out every, every five days and they've been going deep into games and then letting that bullpen take over. Uh, and then they got to the Mets game and it just sort of, 
they just fell flat. I think, uh, listen, I would never make excuses. I think that, um, I think fatigue was a part of it for the Braves a little bit uh, because uh, they were on the tail end of a 20 games in 20 days. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think there was some fatigue there. And I, I just think, uh, I just think the starting pitching really just let them down. And um, their offense, you know, like we said, it's not the old Mets where you can worry about getting getting them back in later in the game. You know, their, their bullpen, especially when you get to Diaz, you know, it's it's pretty much over at that point. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't know. I think uh, I, I think the Mets wanted it more that series. I think they needed to prove that they can they can still do that and they could still play uh, with the team like the Braves. Uh, I think. Uh, we've talked about it before. I think the whole season's coming down to that five game series in City Field on I think it's like August sixth it starts. Yeah. Uh, five games in four days. It's crazy. Uh, yeah. I mean they're only gonna be they're they're separated by two and a half now. It'll probably be something similar to that, you know, when that series happens. So I mean you're gonna come out of that series in the mid August and one of those teams are gonna be in first place and, and sort of setting the pace. So I still think it's going to be very interesting to see what the Mets do at the trade deadline. Uh, the Braves, Braves are going to have to make a splash. They need another pitcher, a starting pitcher, uh, because um, Spencer yeah. Strider, they're, he's he's almost done. You know, he's never pitched more than 90 innings in pro baseball, so yeah, yeah. he's probably not going to finish the season. So yeah, no, I think I think the Mets just played good enough to win, and the and the Braves starting pitching just sort of, it, it was all three games, which was so weird. Uh, yeah. All three games, their starting yeah, yeah. pitcher and just got behind the eight ball immediately. And uh, credit to Showalter for what he's done to to that lineup. They're not free swingers, you know. They're 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 very disciplined and they make you pitch to them. And the Braves just for for whatever reason for those three games they couldn't do it because of course the guys come out the next start against the Nationals and go seven and two thirds and give up three hits. Yeah, and it's like oh okay they can throw strikes after all, but um. No, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be – I can't wait for those games. It's going to be fun times. It is going to be fun. I, I think you nailed it where um, th- this is a different Met team in terms of how picky they are with uh, with Brandon Nimmo staying healthy all year, with uh, Mark Kana. Um, a lot of these guys, Jeff McNeil, they don't they don't just jump up there and, you know, Yoenna uh, Cespedes used to just swing all the time at the first pitch or whatever – this is a different team, you know, and, and so did, so did Javi Baez last year. Um, Alonzo is even very picky, you know, at, at the plate. So um, I think that that water pitching down a little bit, cause they had a high pitch counts, like in the third, fourth inning, because the Mets were like falling balls off and, and, and really going deep into the counts. Um, I, I have a question for you. And then I want to hear from, from Kenny also on this, because I, I if I'm a Braves fan, the one thing that would concern me, I mean, I don't really have many concerns. I know you want another starting pitching. I think you can never go wrong with that, especially as you go into the um, you know postseason here. But I, I would be concerned that at least through the Mets series and from what I've seen in the Braves at times, not all the time, they could be a, a all or nothing. I'm hitting a home run, you know, or striking out type of team. And I think all their runs in that whole series was by the home run. And, and some of them were very impressive, by the way. You know, uh, Austin Riley, oh, my gosh. You know, uh, it's just he's just unbelievable. But is that a concern for you? Uh, yeah, it yeah, it definitely is. It definitely um, – they, they've sort of been like that the last few years. Uh, this year, with runners in scoring position, they've gotten – they when they started off the season, they couldn't win the game. That was their problem, was the runners in scoring position. Yeah. Uh, and – it's sort of so since they started their streak because they're 33 and 11 since June 1st. Oh, uh, Acuna is batting 215 in that time, uh, wow. and he's the you know he sets the table for him. When he gets on base, things happen. Pitchers are more worried. You know, a lot of good things happen, and they just haven't had that yet uh, with yeah. with him. So I, I think a lot of it is they get into those positions late in the game because they haven't strung anything together, and then they sort of they start trying to lift. Uh, the ball out of the park to try to catch up and it's a bad strategy they did it all last year and then when they got in the playoffs all of a sudden they knew how to play small ball yeah Uh, yeah. that's not something good to lean on so yeah they definitely they've struggled in that when they when they've been going bad this year it's what they've struggled in the most Uh, but with Acuna not doing anything and then uh, Ozzy Albies still being out which they're saying mid-August now so not not getting too excited but they're saying mid-August uh I think they just need those folks to sort of start 
getting on base, stop trying to hit home runs, get on base, and then let the big guys, Letton Riley uh, and Matt Olson, come up and, and do their thing. But, yeah, yeah, it's definitely a concern. That's the biggest concern for the team is yeah. hitting with runners in scoring position, unless there's two outs. Yeah. They lead the league in uh, at batting average with runners in scoring position and two outs. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. no wow. outs or one out. They can't, they can't do they can't it. Do it. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's interesting. Kenny, you lived this for a few years, and your Yankee team has transformed a lot. Oh, especially this year, right? Um, yeah. Pitfalls of being that, you know, all or nothing home run team? Um, you can have – the feast or famine can be really tricky sometimes. Because, um, like, you could get through a regular season pretty well, especially, like, you go against, like, the lower-level teams, like, say, the Nationals, the Pirates, the Rockies. You'll be fine. But then come postseason, come like the really tough times, that's what always killed the Yankees. Um, also, like I think of last year with the wild card game, Stanton hits like three bombs, but they're bombs right off the green monster. So they end up being singles. Yeah. Um, but I mean, if I'm looking at the, the Mets and Braves, I think one of the biggest things that sticks out to me, and I'm going to ask you if you are a little concerned about this, um, I believe it was officially announced like right before the all-star game started. Jacob deGrom is set back slightly with a shoulder issue. Now it's only a sore shoulder, but I feel like they've said that. And then it's like, Oh yeah, his shoulder is broken and he's out for another eight years. Like um, what are you concerned about that at all? I, you know, of course, but I, I've in my mind, and I think I, I might represent a lot of Met fans that I'm not depending on the Grom to come back at this moment. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I think the Mets and Braves might, and the Yankees might battle to try to get Luis Castillo from the Reds. And yeah. I'd almost rather go down that road than to depend on, you know, depend on the Grom coming back. There's something, something there. Now soreness that just might be, you know, because he's, he's finally pitching and he probably aired the, I mean, he was still throwing 102 you know which maybe he shouldn't be throwing that that hard i don't know um maybe his body's just not built for that anymore maybe he could throw 98 97 and and be better off because his balls always have movement and so of course that's a concern and uh you know we'll see i you know i like i like the rotation right now i think though if we're going to go deep into the postseason and get there we probably still need another arm whether that's the grom that's great but if you get me a, a Castillo or someone of that, you know, in that range, I'll, I'll be, I'll be fine too. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I have five game series coming up. I, I, I knew Kenny was going to bring that up, man. I'm, I'm really, <laughs> Mike is like happy. He's like, oh, DeGrom has a sore, <laughs> sore shoulder. <laughs> no, I mean, it's just, it's sort of, you see the report and you're like, here we go again, you know? Yeah. Here we I, go again he's been out for a year now, you know, it's been a year since he pitched. Cause I think it was, he made the all-star game obviously last year and he didn't pitch in the all-star game. And then we were like, uh Oh, why did he pitch in the all-star game? Then he's been out ever since, you know? So uh, we'll see. I'm not depending on him. I, you know, unfortunately I, I hate to compare him to this, but you guys will get this. Um, it's starting to remind me a little bit of Chris sale. And yeah, they have kind of the same body type. They're these kind of tall, thin, you know, guys. And, and they both throw, you know, I don't think Sale throws 100, 102, but he throws at least 98, you know, 97, 98. Now he could, he can't catch a break, obviously, you know, a broken finger like that after he gets hit by, you know, line drive. But, and so that's not his fault, but he, he's had the one or two really good years. Obviously he was really good with the White Sox too, but, uh, he can't seem to to get past his injuries too. It's starting to look like that with the Grom, and they they are very similar in what they throw, you know. So uh, I don't know. We'll see. I, I I honestly, if he comes back, that's a big bonus. But I haven't I haven't given it the thought yet. I haven't said, oh, we're gonna see the Grom and Scherzer. We're gonna see Scherzer. <laughs> you know, thank goodness. Let him stay healthy. You know. Um, Can he give us a, a quick? Um, We'll pivot uh, over to the American League here in Yankees, and, and they took care of business with the Red Sox. Uh, looked like they had had a little bit of a tough week. They lost a few games to Cincinnati, and uh, they seem to bounce right back. You feeling good about the Yankees here in the second half? 
Yeah. Um, it kind of seemed like they were like a little ready for the all-star break. Um, I mean, Clay Holmes had a bad week. I mean, that, that happens. Um, but then like after that first, which, um, like Aaron Boone usually doesn't say stuff like this, but he's like, yeah, we probably should have won that game. The first game against the Red Sox. Um, it was, it was one of those points where it was like, Oh, this, this isn't like, this looks like they're kind of going to limp into the all-star break, which I mean, they're still fine. Like I had a friend text me like, Oh, like I'm really nervous right now. I mean, they were still up by 13 games. Yeah. Like, (laughs) but I don't know. It, I think kind of taking care of the Red Sox really kind of makes this more of a three team race as opposed to a four team race or like four teams making the postseason from the division as opposed to three. Um, because the Red Sox, which still is to me probably the most stunning stat I've read this year. The Red Sox have yet to win a series against a division opponent this year. It's crazy. Um, it's That's absolutely crazy. insane. Yeah. Um, but really like after taking that loss and then really just like basically demolishing them, I think 13, one 11 to two or whatever, I think it was really good for them, like to have a good mindset heading into the second half. Matt Carpenter, I don't know how the Yankees found him. Like he has, I think he has 15 home runs now, Um, (laughs) which is insane. Where did he find this magic from? And I, I told you this, I always, and Mike's probably with me. I always liked Matt Carpenter. I thought he was just from afar, you know, um, he always killed the Mets. He always seemed to come through the clutch. In the clutch, I mean, he was he was on those postseason teams in the early, you know, in the 2010s, 2011. Uh, but I thought, I mean, the last couple of years he's been horrible at the plate. You know, I figured his time was done. But oh my goodness, the Yankees giving him a shot, and he's just killing it. He's got 15 home runs. A uh, 13. 13 um, home runs. Wow, that's still unbelievable. He's hit seven in between 2020 and 2021. Um. <laughs> Yeah, it's just been insane. And I think at this point, like, I, I mentioned before, they gave up six prospects for Joey Gallo. I yeah. think it's time to just say that that was a bad move. Oof. And just either trade him, have him on the bench. I mean, he wouldn't be a bad defensive replacement. He has excellent defense. He has good speed. Um, but, like, you got to keep starting Matt Carpenter. Yeah. Also in there, he's batting three fifty four. Um, I forgot, I'd have to see the exact number, but I think it's, I think it's a slugging percentage in his first 30 games. The only person that's had like a similar slugging is a guy named Barry Bonds in 2001. <laughs> like, <is> it's <laughs> just insane what he's doing. And yeah, yeah somebody they, saw something think, in his swing and said, Hey, make this adjustment and man, oh man. And so, and how and he's not crazy old, right? Is he 36, something like that? 36, 30. He's one of those guys that yeah. seem to get old quick, you know? Yeah, 36. He's 36. Yeah. He reminded me of uh, the consistency he had every year, reminded me of like Ian Kinsler or Michael Young, some of those guys on the Texas teams. He would always put up numbers every single year, you know? Um, that's the same. So, the Yankees, you got nothing to worry about. Um, let, let's close out baseball when I'll ask both of you guys, Mike, I'll start with you pumped up about the field of dream games, uh, dream, field of dream game coming up next month, Cubs and the Reds. <laughs> I'm more excited to see the uniforms that they wear than I am for the actual game. Okay. If I'm being yeah. honest, uh, when is that game? It's, uh, it's in like it, August 13th. So it's the after the trade deadline. Yeah. So who yeah. knows what the Reds are even going to look no, like they, at that point. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think I'm more excited to see the jerseys because they both are historic franchises. So I'm hoping they'll pull out some uh, some really, really old school jerseys. Uh, and then, like I said, I mean, there's two. They could have picked a couple better teams, I think. But <laughs> <laughs> All right. How about you, Ken? Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. Like, because yeah. it was so much fun. Like, the White Sox and Yankees last year, both were, like, really good teams in the pennant race and everything. Um, and then also like the, there's the white Sox connection to the field of dreams movie, like Cubs and reds don't really have much of a connection there. And yeah, like when you were scheduling this, like you knew the Cubs and reds weren't going to be that good of teams. 
you could have picked the Cardinals. You could have, like if you're going National League, you could have picked really anyone aside from the Cubs and the Reds. Yeah. I guarantee you there's a lot of Cardinal fans in Iowa as well, right? Because they don't have a professional team. So, you know, the Cardinals always had that. Uh, you always hear about the radio station they had that you could hear in Oklahoma, Arkansas. That's why the Cardinals have such a big national following, you know, over the years. Uh, yeah. A lot of that stuff doesn't matter now with, you know, with uh, with cable and stuff like that. But back, back in the, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, it, it really did. So it should have been the Cardinals, but Cubs Reds. I, I listen, I think baseball should do uh, this stuff more often, though. Special nights like this. Yeah, they could have definitely picked better teams <laughs> for, for this night, but you know, they, they've got to do this more often because they really did it right last year. That was that was really exciting. I imagine the pageantry is gonna be just as good, um, probably even better than the game, uh, I would imagine. All right. Let's shift gears real quick here. Uh, I wanted to get, we want to get Mike's perspective on a couple of things while he have while we have him on from down south. Cause there's a couple of big stories that's happened in the NFL and in the NBA down there in, in Charlotte. And the first in the NFL, you know, Kenny and I have spent a lot of time talking about the whole Baker Mayfield and, and Deshaun Watson saga because he's in Cleveland. So he's gotten a really good perspective on everything. And they certainly uh, a lot, most, I think the majority, right, Kenny, Miss Baker Mayfield and kind of was, um, you know, grateful for, you know, for his service, so to speak, and bringing the Browns back into, you know, respectability, I would say, at least. Yeah. Um, so, Mike, curious, what's the mood down there? Were, were folks in Charlotte excited to get Mayfield there? They embraced him. What's, uh, what's the mood like down there with uh, Carolina getting Baker Mayfield. Yeah, they're, no, they're definitely excited. Um, I mean, they haven't really, I mean, you know, obviously they had Cam Newton, who's a different type of quarterback. They've never really had, you know, a, a gunslinger like, like Maker, Baker Mayfield uh, on the team. And I mean, they got him on the cheap. Uh, they, uh, they are not paying much of a salary. And I think the biggest thing to me is, I mean, they got a guy who is obviously going to have a chip on his shoulder yeah. Um, because of how everything went down. I mean, he took that team and he won a playoff game with Cleveland and then just sort of got hurt the next year. And it was like, all right, see you later. And uh, I think he's going to carry that with him when he plays. I think uh, it's a good storm. I, I think he's going to come back this year. I think he's going to have a real big bounce back here. Uh, the, the fans down there are definitely excited uh, that they have because – Listen, we are, I think everyone here knew Sam Darnold wasn't exactly the answer. Uh, so <laughs> I think um, I think not only are they excited about Mayfield this year, I think Mayfield, if, if he plays good, I mean, he's got a chance to, you know, make it a longer stay here. The, the Panthers owner, he's got very deep pockets. Yeah. Uh, so uh, he, he can make that happen. So I think just the fact that they got this guy on and they're not paying much, they didn't give up much. And they got somebody that is ready to prove to the world uh, that that he can do this thing. Um, I think Mayfield's going to be a top ten quarterback this year. I really yeah. do. Wow. I think he is. Um, I think it. Well, if Christian McCaffrey, uh, if he stays healthy, I think Mayfield will be a top ten quarterback. Uh, so yeah, they're excited. Also, I don't know if y'all saw the, they dropped an alternate helmet because NFL teams oh, yeah. can wear different helmets this year. Finally, they can wear more than one helmet, and the Panthers dropped a black helmet. To go with their all black uniforms, I it almost made me want to be a Panthers fan. It was like yeah, no. that that <laughs> that setup is, oof. So wow. yeah, no, they're excited though for sure. That's that's good to hear. So you heard it here. He's gonna be a top ten quarterback, Ken. I and that's you know, and, and so Kenny, the game one opening uh, one o'clock, uh, is is who? Browns Panthers. Here we go. <laughs> It, it's amazing how that worked out, right? Browns, that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, Got to get your take on on an NBA story here. Uh, that's that's not a fun one, and and uh, and I know you. I don't think you're a Charlotte Hornets fan, if I'm not mistaken. I know you look more at uh, the Tar Heels. I know you're more uh, college basketball, but um, Mikhail Bridges, it, who really just had um, just a phenomenal year. Is it Mikhail or Miles? Uh, Mikhail, right? No, I think Mikhail is Phoenix. He's Phoenix, right? So it's Miles yeah. Bridges, right? Yeah, it's wanna, Miles Bridges, yeah. yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. Miles Bridges, yeah. uh, who's, who really came into his own this past year as a player. 
Um, and and uh, he's got size, strength, speed. He can shoot. He's got he's kind of uh, got it all. But a, a really a terrible domestic incident, um, you know, and it involves the kid as well. What's the feeling down there? I'm sure that's made big headlines down there, Mike. Uh, all the stuff I've seen, even though he pleaded not guilty to all of it, I mean, just uh, you've probably read the reports. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty rough. Uh, the medical report of his his wife, or I think it was wife, right? It was wife. Yeah, came so, out. Yeah. Uh, the medical report came out, and it doesn't, it doesn't look great either. Uh, I tell you, the consensus I've seen down here is, if that's true, then just get him out, like. You know, because like you talked about earlier, the NBA doesn't really have many instances like that. But when they do, uh, it's not like the NFL. You know, the NBA, they usually they take care of their business and they get them out of there. Uh, so I, I think the thing down here is everyone is like, hey, if this is really what happened, then he probably doesn't deserve a spot on the team anymore. Wow. Wow. OK. Kenny, what's your take? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I have much to add there because I think the NBA is usually pretty good about um, – taking care of domestic violence stuff. I mean, we talked about how baseball with Trevor Bauer and others, like they're, they're usually pretty strict too. Um, I mean, from all accounts, it does look like he's, he did what he said he's done. So yeah, it'll be interesting to kind of see what kind of suspension gets doled out, but also they'll probably just release him anyway. And then from there, probably let's say year suspension or whatever. And, and also like a guy like that, once you once you have an incident like that, it's usually really hard to come back to another team. Like I kind of think of like Ray Rice in that sense, where yeah, he was a year or so removed from his domestic violence, everything was kind of like settled and whatnot, but he never really did get another shot because yeah. we were like, well, we don't want that anywhere near our organization. So yeah, well, I, I and this is going to be interesting because. Um, I, I hate to say this, but we sometimes will see, and we're seeing it less now, right? Because Trevor Bauer, obviously a top pitcher, but, it, it, you know, because he's such a good player and, and now, you know, I'll bring another name into this. You, Michael Jordan is, is, is got, is, is going to make some sort of decision here, right? Now, if I'm not mistaken, he was a free agent. It might've been unrestricted free agent, but I, I believe he became a free agent. He's looking for a big payday. But now will Jordan just like step up here and say, hey, he's he's played his last game, you know, with us. I don't know. What do you guys think? I think he's a so he's a restricted free agent, Um, restricted free agent. Okay. I think they're going to wait a little bit longer to see how it plays out. Like I said, he pleaded not guilty to everything. Yeah. Which uh, I'm not sure how you can do that. I mean, there's photos and there's medical reports and there's witnesses. Uh, So I'm not sure how you plead not guilty to that. but. Like we said, I think when it comes down to it, I think Jordan's going to let him go. And then, like Kenny said, I, the NBA, you don't really see folks like this in the NBA. This happen, and then they come back, you know, reformed. And, and oh, my second – the NBA doesn't really do that very much. You know, they uh, – because it's a, it's a small – you know, teams are smaller. The NBA fraternity is a lot smaller. And usually when something like that happens, uh, that, that's sort of it for them. And I hate it for him. He's 24 years old. Uh, but if those reports are true, then – probably, you know, probably best for him to focus on some other things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think, Kenny? Yeah, I think he's probably, he probably would be done. Um, it's also interesting. Cause like, I mean, we've talked a lot about the Deshaun Watson case and there's still nothing resolved with it. Like they've done all the hearings. The hearings were like almost a month ago now and like still nothing. The NBA would probably move pretty quickly. Um, even if it's to move him to like the restricted list or something like that. So he's kind of away from the team, but um, also the Hornets are paying a couple other guys and they've got a guy that they're probably gonna be paying in a few years. So um, even if you did give him like, they probably weren't going to give him the max anyway, but even if you did give him a contract, he's probably one of the guys that would be out based on just the numbers alone. So this might be a good reason to be like, yeah, no, I think we're good. Yeah, I, you know, I, I agree with both of you guys. I think the only thing that um, the, the name that keeps popping in my mind, and I hate to bring that back up, is Jason Kidd. You know, he had this issue. Now, it's a different time. It's, it's a good 10, 12, maybe even 15 years ago. But 
I, I remember him getting a very minor suspension and just going on with his career. And, you know, obviously, you know, he's, he's had a great career hall of fame as a player. And now he's been a really, you know, excellent, excellent coach. And, and that's fine. We're all about second chances. Right. But I just start to think because this guy, now he's not a superstar, but he's a budding star. I mean, the guy was on his way to being a star. I, I'm just concerned. Will there be any, any treatment on that? You know, that, Hey, this guy's too good to let walk. And this is where I think, you know, Jordan could kind of draw a line in the sand here and maybe say that and say, listen, he's a great player or he's going to be a great player, but he's, he has no place on our team anymore, you know, because of what happened. And then as Mike said, I think that, that he, you're right. I think the NBA, they'll, they'll bandy together and say as much as we would love to have a guy like that on our team as a player, you know, we're just not going to give him a second chance, which would be very, very unfortunate. Right. But maybe the, even the right thing to do, because as Mike said, he's, he's probably got to concentrate on some other things more important than basketball, you know? Yeah, and Adam Silver, I, I think Adam Silver is the best commissioner in, in sports. And uh, the way he protects their brand and everything he does for, for their brand, I I think he's going to make it ruling before Jordan even has a chance to. I think he'll step in and say, hey, this is what we see. This is what we got. I don't know if it'll be a one year or if they'll just say indefinite suspension. Uh, but I, I think Adam Silver is going to just like like Kenny said the the Deshaun Watson thing is just dragging on and on and on and on and, and I don't think Adam Silver would let that happen he's if you notice a lot of the big stories that come out of their negative against the NBA those they change pretty quickly he he does a great job of handling those things and getting rid of them uh and I think he's going to do the same with this one yeah oh I agree uh I and that that's a great point all right uh let's get ready to wrap up um but let's have a little fun here with um, All-Star Game. We'll go back to that. And, and, but, but, but first, I want to get Mike's prediction on Donovan Mitchell. Um, winds up on the Knicks or not, Mike? Uh, I think so. I think he's sort of made an interest that he wants to go there. And I think I, – I, what is Utah doing is the, great, is the, is the big question. Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, getting rid of Gobert, I mean, they're getting rid of the defensive player of the year. Uh, I think it's just a matter of time before Mitchell. I don't if he hasn't yet. He's going to ask to get out of there, uh, and I think the Knicks have longed for that that splash, that guy. Uh, so I, I think it makes the most sense. Uh, I would also watch out uh, my man Mark Cuban down in Dallas. Uh, if if Mitchell becomes available, I you know Mark Cuban loves players like that that would come in and you put that dude beside Luca and. Whew, you got some trouble down there in Dallas. So we'll see. I still think he ends up playing at the garden for sure. You heard that, Kenny. We have yeah. hope. We have hope. You know, we just don't want to gut the whole team, you know, to get him and and all the draft choice that because what they asked for was crazy. But I think I think that's the starting point, right? It'll probably come down from there. Um Kenny, let's ask Mike this. Um, because you and I had a little bit different opinions. Would you do Julius Randle for Russell Westbrook? Uh, I would. Wow. I would. Yeah. I think, okay. I think, man, I, I still don't want to give up on Russ. I really don't. Um, it might be Russ, though, the more I think about it. I know he just fired it. Like, I just got rid of his agent recently, and I, yeah. that's when I was like, okay, maybe it is. Maybe it is Westbrook. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is the issue. Um, but I think I'd still give him that chance. I feel like Julius Randle – after having that big year, I feel like last year he sort of came back down a little bit. Uh, but again, I think they're I think they're waiting on bigger things than that. I think they're yeah. going to make it. Um, but Westbrook, I think under the right system, Westbrook got another good couple years in him. He just got to find that 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 fit. Yeah, maybe the Knicks will that fit. <laughs> I know Kenny would. You would do the trade, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because yeah. I think, well, first of all, I think Julius Randle's kind of proven this year. New York long term might not necessarily work. Yeah. Um, but I think more importantly, um, like Julius Randle as your number two option probably isn't going to get you a title. He probably is more of like a good third option. Yeah. And getting rid of that cap space could give you the opportunity to sign someone else or um be able to lock up rj barrett long term too 
So you have your your Jalen Brunson, Donovan Mitchell, RJ Barrett combo. That could do now something. Now you got something. Yeah. Now you got something. Might not be a championship, but you got something. You got at least a round in the playoffs at least, right? And then you never know from there. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's wrap up with this and we'll give Mike a chance to think about it because uh, we didn't. I didn't say this at the beginning. But why don't we wrap up with our favorite all-star game, baseball all-star game memory? And uh, so I'll jump in first. I always talk about uh, the Lee Mazzilli 1979 home run in the kingdom uh, because no Mets used to ever make it. He, he hits a pinch hit, three run home to tie the game at six. Then he draws a walk uh, in the uh, ninth inning. The National League wins seven to seven to six. Uh, he, he wasn't the MVP that year, though. Dave Parker was because he threw two guys out at the plate, one from like the warning track in right field. He was such a great player. Uh, but I got to say, uh, when I thought about it also, uh, it's just a classic memory, the 1970 game. And yes, I'm old enough to remember that. That's the first all-star game I remember watching. And uh, I'll never forget. That's the Pete Rose bowling over Ray Fossey at the plate uh, in the 12th inning. Uh, game is tied. You know, um, the National League rallied. The National League was losing 4-1, to one, going to the bottom of the ninth inning. They rallied to tie it. Goes into extra innings and, um, you know, a little Mets connection here, ex-Mets connection, because Jim Hickman of the Cubs gets the base hit. He was an ex-Met. And then Amos Otis of the Royals makes a, a strike throw to the plate, uh, ex-Met. And, um, and then Pete Rolls just knocks over Ray Fossey, who unfortunately his career was never the same after that. Uh, he wound up going into broadcasting. It was a broadcaster for a long time, I think, with the Indians and then the A's. Um, and, and the National League pulls out, you know, the win five to four. But it was a, just an unbelievable moment. That's kind of, you know, how they uh, uh, typical of Pete Rose, always, you know, Charlie Hustle and always hustling. Even if it was an all star game, he just went all, all out. You wouldn't see that now. There wouldn't be a player that would knock over a catcher in the all star game, you know, now. But uh, you barely see that in a regular season anymore. But, um, but, you know, broke broke his shoulder. He was never the same. But that that is just a, a, a great all-star moment. So, Kenny, what is yours? Um, before I get to mine, I'd seen a stat. I don't know if you'll know this. Well, because you probably – well, I mean, I don't think you saw him play. But um, so Shohei Otani gets picked off in the first inning yeah. playing Kershaw. Very fun moment there. Um, it was. Did you know that there is actually like a, a very good Hall of Famer who got picked off twice in an All Star game? What? Two different All Star games. Um, do you know who it is? I'm guessing Willie Mays. You guessed correctly. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. Okay. Picked off twice in two different All Star games. <laughs> that is embarrassing, though. <laughs> yeah. But back then, they took those all-star games crazy serious, man. That, that was like, yeah, we're going to win this game, you know? Um, so I'm sure he was like, uh, he got on the steal. And uh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Twice, man. That was embarrassing. We forgot to talk about that moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, but I'm going to go with two. Um, first, I'm going to go with 2003 with um, – with the, the big three in the back end of the National League bullpen, possibly future Hall of Famer Billy Wagner, Eric Gagne, who was on steroids at the time, was 80-something straight saves. And then, of course, um, Mike's boy, John Smoltz, at the back end there. Uh. Um, everyone was like, oh, this National League, they got this one. And then Hank Blaylock hits a two-run homer off of Eric Gagne, of all people, um, to, to come back and win. Um, I remember that also because we were watching that together. Um, yes. As I went on the work trip with you. Yeah. Um, the other one that really sticks out is 2008. Um, also, the home run derby is part of that too. Josh Hamilton putting on a show. He didn't oh. win it, but I remember that one was a, a very, that was a very exciting one. But then the All Star game itself, you had um, just the back and forth. Game went into the 15th inning. Um, with what I think it was JD Drew that hit sack fly to win it. Um, also, that was that was also an interesting one because um, the last guy out of the bullpen for the American League was um, your former fun player Scott Casimir, 
um, who they gave specific instructions. Don't pitch this guy because we right. don't want him to play. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. as a result of that, that's when they added in the, the Sunday rule. If you pitch Sunday, then you can't uh, pitch the all-star game. So, but also I think what really sticks out to me from that one, is not just how exciting and how long the game was, but the pregame is the last all-star game at Yankee stadium. Um, and all of the, the former all-stars, like all of the legends that were out on there. I thought that was really cool. Yeah, that was, that was a great moment. Great moment. And you brought up some names of guys also that fizzled out kind of young, right? JD drew, as well as Hank Blaylock. Blaylock had some great years, man. And then I like, he just like disappeared, you know, um, those are, those are a couple of good ones. Mike, how about you put you on the spot? Um, honestly, I, well, I have sort of have two, too, because listen, seeing Stanton uh, just a few days ago in a place he grew up hitting a, a 460 foot bomb into an area where he was like, yeah, I used to sit up there as a kid. To me, I mean, that's as cool as it gets. And then hearing him mic'd up right afterwards. Yeah. Uh, and that guy's got a lot of hate in his career from fans. And I don't know how you can't like that dude. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I don't know how you can't like him. Like, he, he just seems like a very genuine, uh, awesome guy. So that was pretty cool. Uh, to me, I think so. Ken Griffey Jr. was my favorite player growing up, and I remember I think it was '99, uh, the the home run derby in Coors Field. He didn't want to participate. He said he wasn't going to, and then like the day before, he said he was going to. Uh, so he shows up in Coors Field, and I remember him coming up to bat the first time, and the fans booed him because he said he didn't want to participate, and the, and. Uh, they started booing them, and then, you know, that thin air and that swing, next thing you know, balls are flying like 490, and by the end of the night, they were all on their feet cheering it, and he went to win, went on to win again. Uh, and, man, there was some – I mean, like Jim Tomey was in that, Mark McGuire was in that, Chipper was in that. Wow. Um, and for him to just show up, you know how he does a backwards hat, got all the swag in the world, and, and just seeing that swing – uh, that's something that's always stuck out to me, how he just sort of was like, yeah, you know what, I'm going to do it anyway, um, even though I said I wasn't going to. And then the fans booed him, and then an hour later, they're like, we can't boo this guy. <laughs> and then he goes on to win it. Uh, that's something that's always stuck out to me. Because like I said, growing up, he was my favorite player. I wear my hat backwards because of him. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I did not know that. I did not know that. And, I mean, you listen, you can't do much worse than Ken Griffey Jr. You know, there's, there's no doubt. Wow, that's awesome. And I remember that. I, I actually I remember I remember the booze. I remember uh how he turned that right around and then he just, you know, between him, Bobby Abreu, and Josh Hamilton, I just remember they just every single swing, it seems like, was a home run, you know. Um, it's just 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 unbelievable, you know. Hey Mike, thank you for joining us, man. This has been a lot of fun. So we gotta get you back on next month after. The Mets and Braves play that five game series. And yeah, so, uh, absolutely. I got a fun, listen, I got fun. I'm going to a couple Braves games on the road next month, uh, which I'm excited about, including my birthday trip that my wife planned is next. Uh, uh, the middle of August, we're going to PNC Park in Pittsburgh for two uh, games. I can't, man, I can't wait. I can't uh, wait. So, yeah, we'll definitely have to talk and uh, I can tell yeah. you all about that. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. And uh, I can't can vouch for it. That is one of the best places in the country to watch a ball game. Um, and, yeah. and you'll you'll have a lot of fun going to the game. You know, make sure you take in the uh, atmosphere beforehand there. Pittsburgh, they do it right. Man. It's too bad they haven't had a good team again in a little while, but they really do it right. man. that's a great place to watch a game. Uh, one of the best background scenes that I think we've seen. Right, Kenny? Yeah. 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 Kind of seeing the river and everything is just uh, so much fun. And it's so much fun. Absolutely. All right. Sounds good. Kenny, take us home. All right. This is Kenny squared end. Kenny and Mike Clark. <laughs> the sports on the positive tip podcast. Thank you so much for joining us, Mike. Kenny, we'll talk later, buddy. Yep. <laughs>